<clears throat> David, let's start with the new album, Heathen. Was there an overriding theme or, or, or approach? What was the starting point? I didn't think there was one, really. My job seemed to be to start putting together really strong material for Tony Visconti and I to start working on. We haven't worked together in, in years, virtually since uh, 1980, really. We did a few odds and sods in the uh, mid-90s, actually, but um, we hadn't collaborated on, a, on something so uh, big as doing an album. And I think it's. Uh, I think the work that we have done is is really held in quite high esteem by the people that have got it. And I was dead worried that if we rushed, went into it too fast doing a new album, um, we may have the chance of tarnishing that reputation in a way. And I suppose Tony Visconti is the key name for fans because you haven't worked together for what. Since 1980, uh, in a major way, and the last album we did together was Scary Monsters, but we've done so many really good pieces together, Low and Heroes, of course, uh, Young Americans album, uh, even uh, Man of uh, Man, Man Self the World, sorry, I'm exhausted, <laughs> going on exhaustion here. But was there a conscious attempt to try and re-evoke a sense of those times? No, the that's that absolutely what we didn't want to do, and that's why it was very important to me to make sure that we had some very good musical structures before we went in, so that we didn't kind of lazily dip back into what we'd already done. So I spent a lot of the early part of last year making sure that we had quite strong songs to work with before we went in. And how did you write? I mean, do you still write in the same way that possibly 30, 30 years ago with a guitar? Does it start with simple words, melodies? I think I've got different w ways of writing now. I'm, I seem to have collected different uh, uh, process. I, and it really depends on the, the project at hand. I've got, it seems to me that I have three basic types. I've got a, a narrative, literary-oriented kind of album, which is very much about crafted songs. There's something that's more experimental, which is more about, which is more interested in playing around with hybridizations or juxtapositions, and and the music is not necessarily secondary, but it's a, a support to the ideas. So it's more experimental. So you would get things like low out of that, or outside in the mid '90s, and there are other things which definitely are written for the stage and more th kind of theatrical things, where the um, the motivation and the momentum for the thing comes from what I'm seeing in my mind for the for the stage itself, and that would produce the obvious things like uh, Diamond Dogs and indeed Ziggy itself. So within there, that's a kind of a palette that I work from, and an album I'll kind of decide up front if it's going to be A, B, or C, and then modified by the other type. So this one was very much the first A narrative, straightforward with elements of B, <laughs> but very little of C. But it's less experimental, sonically, musically, it's less That's what I mean. It experimental is, it's, than it's, those it's albums earthling outside that absolutely. you made in the 90s. It is about song, uh, uh, song writing uh, in a very straightforward fashion. And that's what I, I felt that Tony and I should use as a kind of uh, an armature for, for what we wanted to do. Um, and I think indeed what for us, I mean, it's a very satisfying album. We th I think that in the, even in the mixing stage, we regarded it as a success, you know. Um, it, 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 it really, it fulfilled all my expectations of what we could do together. Uh, it's not reliant on the past, but yet it has a very signature style, I think. You but can you, tell by listening to it that it was made by myself and Tony. Absolutely. There's but something you, you, about it. But you know. jumped in when I said, are you trying to evoke a sense of the past? Yeah. You said absolutely not. And yet yeah. there, are, there are lyrical references, aren't there? There are the things that would yeah. spark off in the mind of well, the Well, you know listener. what? I think that, uh, I mean, personally, I feel that I've consistently written about the same subjects for over 35, nearly 40 years. I, I, there's really been no room for change with me. It's all despondency, despair, fear, isolation. And spaceships. What is it with spaceships? Well, it's, it's an interior dialogue that you manifest physically, you know what I mean? It's my little inner space, isn't it? <laughs> Writ large. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't dream of getting on a spaceship. It would scare the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no interest or ambition to go into space whatsoever. I'm scared going down the end of the garden. <laughs> there is a song called Gemini, I took a trip on a Gemini spaceship, yeah. which is a cover version actually. It is, it? yeah. It's uh, uh, an, uh, actually an old muse of mine, a character called the legendary Stardust Cowboy, 
who was a stable mate in the late 60s on Mercury Records and uh, chief executive over at Mercury called Ron Obelman quietly and conspiratorially put these three singles in my hand said, hey Dave, you like weird shit, don't you? And I said, yeah, I love weird shit, yeah. He said, well, this is the weirdest we got. And I, he gave me these wonderful anarchic singles by this artist, legendary Stardust Cowboy, and I completely fell in love with him. I thought he was just terrific. So much so that I nicked his name for Ziggy Stardust. Um, and was he a musical influence as well? Not really. I mean, <laughs> if you'd heard the records, weird, yeah. <laughs> they are out there. I guess he, he would be a comfortable uh, kind of stable mate to someone like Wild Man Fisher or one of those kind of Zappa throwouts at, uh, in the mid-60s. Art rock. Very, yeah. Very, well, he's more than that. He has great integrity. Uh, 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 he has no idea that any judgments will be made uh, on what he does or delivers. He's, uh, there is a, a, an incredible naivety to him. Um, he really is solidly outside. Uh, he is an outside artist. He's quite spectacularly outside. And he's on at Meltdown, as it happens. Which I want to talk about a little bit later. Oh, we we'll get just, there. But, I mean, I mentioned there are lyrical yeah. references to your past, but there's yeah. one key moment, I think, where to my ears, you're playing a stylophone, and that yeah. has to be the first time since Space Oddity, which is more than 30 it, years ago. It must be. I and can't... But that, must, but that was a, a reference. Do you know what? Actually, no, it's not. Um, uh, why I started using that is that um, I did a thing as a cover song for um, a collection of Who songs, songs written by Townsend, and what, a few months ago. Last year? Oh, I don't know. Mm. Um, you did pictures of... My memory is a lousy conveyance of any kind of information. Um, it was... Uh, 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 we did the song Pictures of Lily, and uh, on there I used... I dragged the stylophone out. I, somebody had sent me one. It was I wish I could say it was my actual original, but somebody from England had sent me one with the original Rolf Harris uh, boxing on it. And I was absolutely delighted. I hadn't seen the thing since 69, 70, whenever it was. So I used it as the solo instrument for Pictures of Lily with, uh, I thought, great results. <laughs> I thought it was tremendously impactful. And so it, I said, I, I really should start using this again on something. So I put it in my collection of old synthesizers. And I've got a lot of old stuff that I've kept over the years that I really dragged out for this album. But it is only you and Rolf who have had hits with the style of It now, really it? It, Yes, it, uh, me and Rolf. And we're doing a collection next year of uh, we're just going to choose our favourite songs and uh, Rolf and I are going to... Nah, maybe we won't, eh? <laughs> maybe we shouldn't even think about that. Maybe that was a terrible idea. You didn't, when you were playing the stylophone on yeah. Space Oddity, it didn't have the little picture of Rolf on there at the time, did it? Was it a Rolf Harris stylophone? I think maybe so that my ego wouldn't get bruised, as one does get very bruised at 19. Uh, I think they just sent it to me without any packaging, if I remember rightly. I certainly don't remember seeing Rolf Harris's face on it. Now that was... We are going back more than 30 years, or just over 30 years. Yeah, right. um, we actually recorded it in 60, uh, very early 69. Um, then it was all suddenly, oh, the Americans are going to launch a space. Rush, 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 and they, they kind of got it out. But even within that first single, and it was a great, a classic pop single, you were still yeah. a adopting a persona. You were still playing a character there. Where did that start from? Was it the well, idea no, I, of... I, I, no, I, I would disagree there. I mean, as the singer, uh, I don't think... I think... I don't think I'd gotten that far into the idea of characterization for myself. What I was keen on doing was writing in such a way that it would lead me into writing some kind of rock musicals, which is really, I think, more than anything else, probably what I really wanted to do in the late 60s. I think I wanted to write a new kind of musical. And that's how I saw my future at the time. Um, oh, it really was exploring the theatricality of pop, because people... Yeah, no, absolutely it, that. Just... Yes, it was that, uh, yeah. But I, I was still only kind of being an interpreter of a song at that time. I still was sort of David Bowie. The real characterization really didn't kick into the Ziggy. Thing. But the, what I was going to say was, retrospectively, yeah. people were saying that you were playing those characters, not as a way of exploring the theatricality of pop, but actually of, of hiding. Uh, no, not anything more than shyness, really. I mean, I was always quite a shy kid. Uh, and I didn't come alive on stage, I just got even shyer. But I found I didn't get so shy if I sort of adopted a character, so it was, it was a convenience. 
as well as a very bright theatrical idea. <laughs> and taken to I subsequently realised. <laughs> but taken to an extreme with Ziggy. No, it was just the first time the theatre of that nature had been seen in rock, so I don't think it was extreme by theatrical standards at all. But it was certainly kind of new for rock and roll. I don't know, I'll have to read one of the books out on it, get a better answer. There's so many books. Really, I should go and read a book on it. I remember, th especially in France, I get followed around. There's always somebody saying, why did you kill Ziggy? And this, I kind of get bored with it, you know, because I've done such a lot of work in 40 years. Ziggy was only going for 18 months, which is not really a very large part of my working life. And I don't think I can say any more than I've already said for the past 30 or so years. But do you ever um, look back? I mean, obviously you don't want to talk no, about it, but do you ever look back? Never. Never. Uh, only with uh, fond amusement. And, uh, and really, I'm very proud of it and very happy that I did it all. But it's very much not what I'm doing now. So on the new album, then, are you talking about yeah. David Bowie now? Yeah, I think I am. This is not a reassessment of... No, I life. think it's. I think these are very real fears and anxieties that were uh, provoked actually well before the 9/11 thing, that dreadful tragedy. Um, I think living in the city. I've lived here now with my wife for ten years this time around, and before before now I've lived here often. So I think I probably lived in the city more than any other city in the world over the last 40 years. Um, so I guess you could call it my home. Um, and that, that, but there is a low-level anxiety that buzzes here at all times and has been buzzing here ever since I've known it. And I think one, because of my particularly, my orientation towards the apocalyptic, uh, I, I think uh, it, it rather hones that um, and rather galvanizes that for me. Um, and it just was, it just... Uh, one really, especially the, the you know the advent of a new child in my family, mm. my daughter, really sort of focused my fears and apprehensions about what kind of. I mean, what a disappointing 21st century this has been so far. You know, I had personally really quite high expectations about the future. I had no idea it would it would sort of capitulate into this awful mess and th this dreadful feeling of. Uh, an involuntary kind of lack of ability to be able to do anything about this impending possible disastrous series of consequences which you know one has so many suspicions about what are the real reasons and the real causes to them you know it's not it's not a pleasant way to live and I, I, I look at my daughter and sometimes for the first few days after 9-11 I looked at her and couldn't feel happy which is a terrible thing to feel I looked at her and just felt fearful, you know. And there's one song on the album which seems to address those fears, a song called Afraid, which is... Yeah. <laughs> or is that taking I'm it too not, literally? I'm, I'm, you are afraid. I'm, I'm not pliant today, am I? Um, that actually is probably the one song in the album that I don't see as being representative of me, only because that particular character, the progenitor of that particular song, is, is talking in terms of how as long as he goes along with the sheep-like mentality of everybody else, he won't feel afraid. He believes that his security will be bought if he plays the game, mm. so to speak. So I think, I hope, I will unfortunately have to distance myself from the song and say it was an irony of kinds. It was, uh, it was, it's an interesting deceit, but it's not mine. But I read it because it was written in the first person. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. repetitively. Yeah. It keeps going over the, the yeah. fears and the neuroses. I do. I mean, obviously, a fr uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, fear is, is very strong within the album. I think one of the major fears, actually, that underlines it all for me personally is a fear that there is no spiritual life. You know, one sort of hopes that there really is. I'm not. I confront it every day of my life. It's something I've always thought about. Um, I'm a very spiritual person in as much as I've had this awful bloody journey searching for a spiritual life that makes some kind of, that firstly uh, actually meets my expectations of what a spiritual life should be and how, what kind of part it should play in my life. Maybe I ask too much, but I, 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 I keep, I keep coming to a dead end, but it's, uh, I, I know, I mean, as I get older, my questions are fewer, but I ask them. I bark them more <laughs> than ask them, actually. Um, 
and I keep approaching them in the same, uh, from a different direction each time. Uh, but I probably only have three or four questions left. I guess that by the time I do my last album, I'll only have one question. But this may be wildly off the mark, but one of the things that I think marks your lyrics over the years has been the questions in there. A lot of the lyrics are it, marked very by questions. And on yeah. this album, yeah. there are more declarations. I don't think there are any Yeah, they're stubborn, there. they're naive declarations that if you're not going to do anything about our world, you know, we're, you're not going to have any support for your plans in the future. God. Uh, there's a lot of that kind of, you know, bald-faced idiot statement. But, but it it's the frustration. Yes. It's the actual frustrations of day-to-day -day life, you know. Uh, it's... Idealism is... Uh, you have these ideals, you know, but they're usually based on such irrational... Uh, they don't fit into reality too well. Is writing a catharsis? I mean, do you try and work out those fears in the lyrics? It seems that I do do that, and I can't say that it's actually necessarily an enjoyable situation each time either. I don't think it's something that I enjoy 100%. There are t occasions when I really don't want to write that. It just seems that I have a physical need to do it. Um, that it, it, it's so much part of my life. Uh, I can't really see a day going past without me doing something or other, either melodically or lyrically. Um, and sometimes when I'm forming the songs themselves, they're not particularly... In fact, there's an instance of that on this album. The song Heathen uh, came together quite um, early on in the making of the album. And uh, I realised the, wor um, the words were literally tumbling out for it. I, I was very alone, very isolated up in the studio one early, as is my wont, at uh, five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. Um, I was up in the studio on my own waiting for everybody else to get up. Um, and I was kind of putting the, the day's work together and, and this thing started appearing for me. I'd already written a, a melody that I very much liked and the words started appearing out of nowhere and I just couldn't control them. And I realised what it was that it was about and I really didn't want to write it because I didn't, not sure that I really wanted to sort of, you know, voice or articulate those particular thoughts at this time. But it just wouldn't stop, and I had to write it. And I was in tears by the end of the thing. It was, it was really, I'm not sure if it was. Uh, it was a traumatic moment for me, at least. Possibly, it was an epiphany. I don't know. I have to go and look at epiphany in the dictionary and see if it was an epiphany. I think it was a, a traumatic epiphany. It was a <laughs> <laughs> but you were revealing something to yourself just by putting the lyrics uh, to out. myself. And yeah, what is that yeah. Song which is about then? That's, for me, that's confronting it, was, spirituality. it was. It's. It has that. It, why I called it heathen is that it's not taught. It's a, not a, t a dialogue between a man and his god. It's a dialogue between a man and life itself. So it almost. It's almost pagan in some respects, you know. But it definitely has a, a heathen propensity in that way. It, uh, it's a man confronting the realisation that it, life is a finite thing and that he can already feel it, life itself actually going from him, ebbing out of him, the weakening of, of age. Um, and I didn't want to write that, you know? I didn't want to know that I do feel that. Who does? It's something that's marked Neil Young's work. There's a Neil Young song on this album. Yeah, a very yeah. early Neil Young song. But it's and something yeah. that's marked his work. He's been very candid and written about that ageing process and about growing old and fearing growing old. But it's something that's never really been associated with you. Is this, well, I've not been way, his age, have I? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I am now getting to that stage where I'm sure that it's... It's not the age itself, you know. I mean, age doesn't bother me. I really, uh, so many of my heroes were older guys. Mm. Uh, uh, it, it's the, it's the, asp it's the lack of years left that weighs far heavier on me than the age that I am. I feel pretty good, frankly, and, and I, I have a wonderful life. I'm so lucky to have found the right woman to share my life with. We have a child, and uh, I do what I've always wanted to do. I'm a writer. Yet it's the it, it's having to let go of it all, you know. Even more so now, it's 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 so much more poignant. There's such a uh, uh, for me often there's such a cloud of melancholia about knowing I'm going to have to leave my daughter on her own at a you know I don't know what age that's going to be, thank God. But it just 
doubles me up in kind of grief. And a lot of the album is addressing that kind well, of Well, I think issue. that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have made this album if, uh, if we didn't have our daughter. Mm. Yeah, it, I'm not saying the whole album is about her, but I think it provoked questions that search certain areas of my own discomfort and anxieties. But would you say it was overall a more candid, more honest album than many of your Well, albums, that's, that's unfair. It, it, that's like saying that I've done my best to conceal myself on, that, on my albums, and that's not right. Many of my albums are impressionistic. Mm. I don't write in a kind of uh, autobiographical way. I never have done, and it's only recently that maybe I've started to, and this may be something to do with age and, and the way that one matures. Um, I don't know, it all gets very grey and green, doesn't it? Uh, I, 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 although I don't think I'm going to become a Catholic. Um, but you're trying to get to the heart of the I'm matter. I'm not that mad. What? <laughs> you are trying to get to the heart of the matter. Um, I think I'm writing for a different purpose. I think that's what it is. I think one's reasons for writing change an awful lot through life. Are you writing more for yourself now rather than yeah, for the very fans? Much because so. there, were, there was a whole yeah. set of expectations that your fans, and they are devoted, very loyal, quite yeah, obsessive are. fans, and yeah. they have been over the years, and yeah. they look for certain motives. Yeah. And Incredibly bright, wonderfully intelligent people, of course. <laughs> but do you ever, did you ever play to their expectations? Well, I, about the, um, again, that's, that's, that's a contrived statement. Come on. Um, I wrote for an audience, yeah. Uh, um, uh, I really wanted to be, as I say, right at the very beginning, I wanted to write theatre. And uh, I guess I could have just written for theatre in my living room, but I think the intent was to have a pretty big audience to come and watch it. But those ambitions do are modified and change over the years. I mean, any writer, I think, especially a pop writer, writes for an audience. Over the years, when I think when I found that actually working for an audience, which is a slightly different thing, performing for an audience, um, wasn't anything that I particularly enjoyed. I, I, I realised fairly soon on that I wasn't a born performer. I don't like performing very much. I unfortunately can do it, which is not great because you put on tour a lot. Um, I, I'd much prefer to do a few shows and then uh, get on with my next project, you know. So I, I less and less thought about the audience's expectations, and especially now at this time in my life, I really am writing for myself. I really am writing for myself. Are you worried at all? I mean, you talk about the ageing process there and the different questions that, that arise. Do you ever worry about working within the pop genre? No, I mean, you no. You talk no. about being an artist, you talk about being a writer, that doesn't no, worry you at all. I'm totally indifferent to that. Mm. No. Uh, and again, it's not the ageing pro... You must understand, I don't have a problem with ageing. In fact, I embrace that aspect of it and am able to, and obviously am going to be able to, quite easily. It doesn't phase me at all, ageing. It's the death part that's really a drag. <laughs> you know? Everything else I can quite in, uh, cope with. Quite cope with. I don't know, I'll see when my body starts seizing up, see if I can cope with that as easily, I'm saying now. Probably not. I'll probably get very angry and irritable. And I can't lift my leg up like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're still going to be doing the scissor kicks on stage, are you? Yeah, well, I can, well, I can still do them, yeah. <laughs> I used to, I mean, because obviously you've always talked about your music, your words, as an art form. And I know you've been, well, you had been painting for 20 years. You've probably been painting for 30 years. I've been, yeah, I've been now, are you, are you still time. painting? Is that uh, just another outlet and expression? Yeah, um, it's something that I do enjoy an awful lot. It's uh, not something I've been able to do recently. One of the major reasons is that I gave up my studio here. I've got to find another one. I find it very difficult to work. And I, I, I can write music, and uh, uh, in fact, I have to write music at home and uh, with my family. That seems to be no hindrance at all. But I don't seem to be able to do visual work uh, with my family around. It's very odd. Um, so it's rather slowed me down because I need to find a new studio. I haven't done anything of any note. I've done some sketching and some charcoal work, but I've done nothing that really I've been able to get my teeth into for 18 months or so. I'll tell you who I like in England at the moment is Banksy. Hmm. I think he's really good. A graffiti Hey, artist. Banksy, if you're listening, <laughs> I really think your work's great. Yeah, I think he's tremendous. I like his work a lot. I think he's going to be quite important, that one. Are you still following the art movements in Britain. Yeah, I like to see what people are doing. But I like to see what people are doing in any any form, really, you know. I mean, I, I, 
I, one of the things that, one of the joys about being a musician, it was the first uh, career that really I felt I could drag all my other hobbies and interests into. And I wouldn't have to, if I'd gone into, uh, oh, I don't know, car design, <laughs> I don't think I would have been able to drag theatre into it in quite the same <laughs> way or, you know, have well, car poetry or long. something. Yeah. But that's interesting. But, but, what? If you started out now, yeah. at the age of 19, would yeah. you have been sitting in a bedroom writing pop songs, do you think? Look, the trouble with futurism is, is that all it generally is is an elaboration on the recent past. Uh, I'm not sure I can really answer that with any kind of intrinsic worth. <laughs> My, all right, I'll stab a guess at it. I'd say no, I probably would have gone straight into the internet, I think. I would have seen that as a really kind of viable option for a ex form of expression, and somehow. I don't know, I just love music though. I mean, and probably a combination. Probably, uh, yeah, it would have been something to do with the internet and music. And you're still excited by contemporary music? You're still I love influenced music. by I music. I love it, I love it. And there's an, uh, obviously some contemporary influences on this album. Yeah, I suppose there might be. I'm not so sure what they would be though. It's the same as uh, when I worked in Berlin. There you are, here. You see, you see I've, you got me doing an anecdote. Didn't actually. Uh, I see it written time and time again that one of the great influences on the albums that we did there um, is Kraftwerk. But you know what? We are the antithesis of what Kraftwerk were doing. They were working in a very robot-like, fast, 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 young man, fast. It's not going to happen, is it? Give me, give me a couple of minutes. Kraftwerk were working in a very robotic, minimalist fashion. There was no live drum kit. They were using an uh, electronic drum kit. And they kept away from the idea of blues form or R&B form completely. It has a very European sensibility and almost 19th century structure to the music. Um, whereas I was using a very funky band with uh, live musicians, live real-time tempo, and s kind of swathing it with atmospheric sounds over the top with uh, myself and Visconti and Nina. But it was the, at their provocation, the fact that they were working in a new area, the area itself became something that captivated me. And they're terrifically responsible for my moving into that genre of music. But I wouldn't say that, that you'd, if you put the two albums low, or, uh, and radioactivity, say, next to each other. There's absolutely no similarity whatsoever. And we work within a blues structure, frankly. We were playing blues with kind of strange sonic sounds over it, if you have to kind of nail it down to something. But it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have heard Kraftwerk in 1974. So it's that kind of, you know, inspirational, I think, is the word, you know. I tend to be inspired by the work of others very much. And I, I'll only nick if I can get away with it. And you do nick? No, not me, Gov. <laughs> I'm as clean as the driven snow. David, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure.